Okay, we're recording now. So, as I was just saying, heterogeneous nucleation for solid phase transformations is very much like nucleation, a uh, heterogeneous nucleation doing for solidification, except that we have multiple sites, right? We can nucleate on vacancies, dislocations, grain boundaries, stacking faults, inclusions, or free surfaces. And so we have a end up with a term in our free energy that relates to the amount of defect energy removed by the nucleation event. We can look at nucleation at grain boundaries, and this is exactly analogous to nucleation at a mold wall for solidification, uh, nucleation on a triple line. The fact that interfacial energy can be quite high. And if we can have a co co um, coincidence between certain lattice planes means that we can have a heterogeneous nucleation that leads to a uh, orientation relationship. If we have certain interfaces that are coherent or semi-coherent relative to the, the an incoherent interface um, it means essentially that this is going to happen all of the time because of the way the Boltzmann statistics works out and the, uh, the small changes in energy mean that uh, this configuration is going to happen at a lower degree of undercooling because it has less of an activation barrier. And so it means that uh, nuclei that have this orientation relationship are going to be uh, much more preferentially formed, right? So essentially, because of the way the statistics works out, uh, this is essentially always going to happen um, because of its, its lower energy nature, right? nucleation on dislocations, vacancies, and we talked about the relative rates of these different of these different sites, right? And that homogeneous nucleation is the hardest. Nucleation at vacancy clusters, then dislocations, stacking faults or other low grain, low energy grain boundaries. Grain boundaries are interphase boundaries are the, the tend to be where a lot of um, nucleation uh, happens for secondary phases, right? Um, quick question. Sure. So hardest to easiest delta G means uh, delta G star gets smaller as you go down this list, right? Delta G star gets smaller as you go down this list, yes. Right, and then obviously it free surfaces and cracks, right? So that was just a quick review of where we were. I want to take some time today and look at this sort of in practice in two systems, right? The first is uh, precipitation strength in aluminum alloys and then in uh, uh, steel, right? Also, I thought we had a reading quiz that was due today, but I couldn't find it in the assignments. No, there is no reading quiz due today. Hmm. Right? I, I wanted to get the exam grades posted before I did that. So you guys will see a flurry of activity today with reading assignments, right? But there, there is no quiz today. Okay. Okay, so these are up on um, Carmen. These are some notes from a slightly older version of uh, MSC 5441. Um, This is from 2017. 
uh, the newer versions um, are just a little bit different. So, but I wanted to to just have have you guys have available um, availability of some of this. If you're interested, you can of course go to the YouTube and and watch the the detailed lectures um, on these. What is interesting with aluminum alloys is that there's not a lot of elements that have any appreciable solubility in aluminum. Uh, the top hat code. 8080. So it should be working. Um, so there's not a lot of elements that have an appreciable solubility. Um, and so essentially what that means is that there's a lot of uh, um, your alloying choice is limited and many elements are going to lead to the presence of many elements is going to lead to secondary phase formation, right? And the quintessential one for this is aluminum copper. Right, these are the 2000 series aluminum alloys. 2024, the famous aircraft alloy, is probably the most famous um, in this. And what's interesting is we have a uh, phase diagram that looks something like this, where we see the maximum weight percent copper that can be. Uh, dissolved is about 5% at elevated temperatures. At lower temperatures, uh, there's virtually no solubility of copper and aluminum. But the thermodynamically stable phase, the state of phase, has a very large and complicated unit cell and forms an incoherent interface, so it doesn't readily form. What instead happens is we get a series of uh, intermediate phases. And in fact, we don't want the thermo, we don't want theta, the thermodynamically stable phase. That gives us bad properties. Most of the time we're trying to get at this a fine dispersion of this theta double prime phase to give us good strength properties. Right? All right. So this is just I review the nucleation theory for the, uh, so this looks fairly, fairly familiar. So the first phase that's going to form out, if you are at, say, a little less than 2% copper, and we can hold down at temperatures around 100 C or so, and we will precipitate out GP zones. Right? So what are GP zones? These are ordered clusters of copper atoms, right? That have the same FCC structure and they form a coherent interface with the aluminum matrix. So these have such a small nucleation barrier that they essentially can nucleate homogeneously. Okay, and so these are very small. So this is a TEM image. This length scale is 10 nanometers here. And what you actually see, this contrast doesn't, isn't atomic number contrast. We're not actually seeing the copper clusters. What we're seeing here is the strain, the elastic distortion. So this, this region here actually exaggerates the size. So these are a couple nan clusters of a couple couple nanometers. Um, but the main thing is, is they can nucleate fairly easily, right? So if we look at the hardness, of uh, 
aluminum copper alloys over time. And we look at the, this is the composition. We're aging at 130 degrees C and we look at the time that it's being held. So this is a fairly, fairly low temperature. But what we can see is we get an increasing hardness as GP zones precipitate, and then we reach a stable plateau, right? And this stable plateau is essentially when we've reached this metastable composition on the phase diagram, right? This is our GP zone composition. So we still have some copper in solution. We really don't want copper um, but we're at this sort of equilibrium, metastable equilibrium with GP zones. And then there's usually a, like a dwell period where nothing much happens. And then all of a sudden we start to get an increase in hardness again, right? What is this increase? This is, uh, the nucleation of theta double prime, right? And where does it where does it occur? This normally will nucleate on the GP zones themselves. So the GP zones serve as nucleation sites for the next intermediate phase, right? The theta double prime phase. And this is the phase that we're, is technologically more important. Right, so if we're say out here at 4%, we have a GP zone composition that's almost pure copper, right? And we have a matrix composition that's going to be right here around maybe say 2%, right? Then we're gonna nucleate this theta double prime. Well, what's theta double prime look like? Um, we can skip over this stuff. This is all about strengthening, right? Okay. So theta double prime is these, and theta prime are lar much larger than the GP zones. They're only partially coherent with the lattice, right? Unlike GP zones, they have a particular composition and crystal structure, right? So the, they have a crystal structure that's intermediate between the solid, super saturated solid solution, so four S's, and the equilibrium phase, right? And they're nucleated from the GP zones or heterogeneously at other lattice dislocations, right? So. Here we see an old TEM image, right? This is the nucleation of theta double prime on dislocation networks, right? So what does theta double prime look like? Whoa, what happened to my bullet points? That's weird, um, right? So what we, theta double prime is actually these alternate layers of alternating layers of copper aluminum right? And so it's a structured ordered unit cell that forms a semi-coherent. So essentially you can think of this as GP zones organizing themselves into these stacked layers, right? We have single layers of, of, of copper atoms. The theta prime phase has the composition of Al2Cu, right? And it has uh, this unit cell, right? Um, it's more similar to the equilibrium phase, right? And these are gonna form as plates very much on dislocations, right? And then the equilibrium theta phase is this very complicated tetragonal unit cell uh, that has to form completely incoherently. So there's no coherency. These tend to form larger precipitates that are farther apart 
because nucleating them is very hard, even heterogeneously. So they will tend to grow, um, grow larger and will have much smaller of them. Uh, many fewer of them, not much smaller than them. That's like not even real English, right? So, so what do we, what do we see, right? This is a general trend that we see in lots of materials where we have intermediate phases. We start at a easy to nucleate coherent precipitate, right? We then transform through one or more intermediate phases whose composition becomes closer and closer to the thermodynamically stable phase and whose interface who becomes less and less coherent until eventually, if we hold it for long enough, we will reach our thermodynamic equilibrium, right? So what's interesting here is the other trend we see, right? So if we look at GP zones, right? They're the metastable phase, so they're higher up on the Gibbs free energy diagram. But if we look at the tom common tangent, what it tells us here is that GP zones are much richer in copper than the other phases, right? And when they form, the matrix itself is going to retain more and more uh, copper, right? The common tangent hits at a point that's further over to the right. All right. So we have precipitates that are richer in copper and a matrix that's still richer. We nucleate our theta double prime from our GP zones heterogeneously. We get another fairly dramatic decrease in free energy of our system. A lot more copper comes out of our matrix, but our precipitates themselves are not as copper rich, right? This is... Uh, Al2Cu, so what this means is if that's going to happen, I need a lot more of these, right? My lever rule basically says if my precipitates themselves are less rich in copper and my matrix is less rich in copper, in order to for mass balance to work, I need a lot more of these precipitates, right? So that means I'm going to have um, uh, far more of these than GP zones, right? Or not necessarily more overall, but a larger volume fraction of theta double prime relative to the GP zones, right? Remember these GP zones are tiny Right, so it doesn't take a big increase in size to get a much larger volume, right? And what we see is over time, our total free energy decreases, right? We have the formation of GP zones, then we have a dwell time until heterogeneous nucleation occurs then we have a dwell time until we get more heterogeneous nucleation, right? And we have these overall, at each step, we have an overall activation barrier that needs to occur. And if we add those all up, right, each step is easier, right? In terms of our Boltzmann statistics, right? the relative increase in our active or the, our activation energy for each step is relatively the same right 
But if we add the total ener free energy up together, we'd have it to go right from our supersaturated solid solution to theta, we'd have a huge barrier that we would need to overcome, right? And that's just never going to happen. All right. I talked about the role of vacancies when we talked about uh, diffusion. And here's really sort of why it's important, right? If we take and hold our, in this case, so this is aluminum silicon, but it's very similar. They also form GP zones. If we look, if we hold into our single phase alpha region and we quench from a temperature that's high in the single phase, alpha region or a temperature that's lower in, but still in the single phase alpha and quench down to the same temperature, right? We get drastically different amounts of precipitates, right? From this point, from the L point, we get 10 to the six precipitates per centimeter cubed. If we hold up here, we get 10 to the 15 precipitates per centimeter cubed, cubic centimeter, right? And basically what this tells us is we have a lot more vacancies up here than we do down here. And these vacancies are critical for uh, the formation of um, precipitates, right? So mostly through being able to increase the mobility. So vacancies, this excess vacancies that we get from quenching from a higher temperature is going to allow us to diffuse faster, right? Our, the copper or the silicon or, or the magnesium in the aluminum that's gonna form GP zones can actually move and form the clusters, right? And the presence of the vacancies also helps by reducing the strain field, reducing the strain field around uh, the clusters and allows for easier nucleation, right? Okay. So this is basically just looking at the relative diffusivities um, in this, right? But what I, interesting to point out, right, is that grain boundaries act as sources and sinks for vacancies. So that means the vacancies near the grain boundaries can be annihilated on quenching, where the vacancies in the grain interior cannot. So that leaves us with these precipitate free regions around grain boundaries. These are known as precipitate free zones, right? And that's just because we don't have enough excess vacancy concentration to assist with diffusion. And so we don't get any precipitates here, right? Which is really interesting. And the width of this precipitate free zone depends on the rate of quenching, right? How fast can we eliminate the defects, right? And we see them in, this is aluminum magnesium, aluminum zinc mag uh, type alloys, right? And you clearly see this precipitate free zone. We also see something interesting. We also see heterogeneous nucleation of precipitates at the grain boundary, right? In fact, this grain boundary is almost completely uh, is completely covered. So, okay. So the question that just came in in the chat is, how is it that quenching annihilates vacancies instead of freezing them in place. 
that's actually a really good question. So if we look at, go back and we look at the equilibrium number of vacancies, right, is strongly temperature dependent, right? Because we have the entropy term, right? So as we lower our temperatures, the temperature, our system wants to have fewer and fewer vacancies, right? But our diffusion length also goes down, right? Remember our diffusion term is square root dt, right? So the vacancies want to annihilate, but to annihilate, they need to diffuse to the grain boundary. And there's only going to be a short distance over which that can occur before the diffusion term gets, the diffusivity gets so low that they are not, they can't be easily removed, right? So your intuition is correct. If we could have a exceptionally fast quench all of the vacancies would be frozen into place, right? But because our quench isn't instantaneously fast, there's some region near the grain boundary where the vacancies can diffuse to annihilate, right? And so we see that in the width of the GP zones, right? We can, so we can get at the width of the width of the precipitate freeze zone where we don't see any GPs, GP zones. Um, so, so yeah, so the intergranular region, if we quench slowly, right? And so, yeah, that's the second thing I was just about to get to, right? We also have heterogeneous nucleation that can occur at the grain boundary, right? So that means if we're nucleating precipitates at the grain boundary, we're dropping our solute concentration in a region around the grain boundary as well, right? So the secondary cause for the precipitate free zone is we have less solute here, right? Because solute's been essentially sucked away to nucleate at the grain boundaries, right? So diffusion is critical here. Diffusion is the only way we have to move material, right? And so, Square root dt is really important, right? What is our, our local diffusivity in time, right? So I need to move copper, or in this case, I need to move zinc and magnesium through my aluminum, right? The length scale on which that's going to happen is going to depend on the square root of the diffusivity times time, right? And so it all comes together, right? Because vacancies are going to affect my diffusion rates, right? And it's also going to the diffusion, diffusivity is also going to affect how much solute I actually have here to make it, to make this happen, all right? All right, so Um, we can skip over the effect of, of trace elements here, right? Um, but that's sort of just an example that I wanted to show you, aluminum copper, right, is, is to what happens in sort of a real system, right? And again, the big idea that I want you guys to get from this is there's a sequence that happens, right? 
the thermodynamically stable phase is too difficult to nucleate because it's large unit cell that forms an incoherent interface. So super high activation barrier. So instead we nucleate nearly homogeneously or homogeneously a non-equilibrium metastable phase that has a coherent interface. From that, we can nucleate our intermediate phases heterogeneously at our, and on top of these metastable GP zones to bring us closer and closer to the thermodynamically stable phase. The other point that's important is a lot of times the thermodynamically stable phase isn't what we want from a materials performance and properties point of view. So we need to think about how do we optimize our processing to get the actual phase we want, right? And in terms of these aluminum copper alloys, it's the theta prime phase that actually gives us the best strengthening properties. By the time we get up to theta prime and theta, the precipitates are too large and too far apart to get any useful proper, uh, strength out of them. They're also brittle and leads to fracture, right? But of course, you know, the, the, the specific properties are not really what's important for this class. The, the, this idea of a sequence, a nucleation sequence that gets us uh, through um, from easy to nucleate to more difficult is what's is what's important. Right. So I want to take a look at uh, a little bit today and on Friday. Um, so just a reminder, Wednesday is uh, Veterans Day. I didn't realize um, that I thought Veterans Day, they took that away as a university holiday because of the COVID thing, but it's still on the schedule. Um, so there is no class on Wednesday. Okay, just a reminder. Um, but for just the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about the growth of ferrite, right? So we remember from our iron carbon phase diagram, we have our austenite phase, which is FCC. When we come down in temperature, we have a eutectoid reaction type uh, here, and we form BCC ferrite or alpha, and there's very limited carbon solubility here. So we form uh, carbides, the most common being our Fe3C, but there's actually a whole bunch of different uh, carbides. This is cementite here. This is actually um, thermodynamically unstable, but it, it is very highly metastable, right? So it doesn't go away. But the actual equilibrium phase is graphite, not, not cementite. But there are tons and tons of other carbides uh, that can form um, do I have them here? No, I guess they're in the other, but that's okay. Um, there are tons of other carbides that can form. They're not really technologically important. Um, but we, I just want to point out that cementite is a really complicated unit cell with iron and carbon. Um, and I, I think it's, it's actually pretty cool. Okay, so the important reactions, right? We have this paratectic up here, super important for the welders, not so important for us material scientists because most of the time we're never really up there. And anything we process in the bulk, we're going to be doing a lot of additional heat treatment within this austenite regime. So we pretty quickly erase out any microstructural effects that are left from this paratectic transformation. 
that isn't the case for welding, right? When you're going from liquid down through solid without any additional um, heat treatment here. So the uh, um, this paratectic region has a, a much greater effect on the microstructure of welds than it does on the microstructure of bulk steel um, materials, right? Um, right, and of course, remember the uh, Um, I forget what I was going to say here. Okay, but anyway, um, what I want to talk about here is essentially the growth of uh, ferrite, right? And for steels, we're going to be mainly concerned here with carbon compositions that are near this eutect eutectoid point, so 0.76, right? So if we're less than this, we have a um, hypo-eutectoid, and we're going to form um, pro-eutectoid ferrite and perlite. Um, if we are at the eutectoid composition, we're going to have just perlite. And if we're higher, we're going to have pro-eutectoid cementite and perlite, right? So what is... What do I mean by perlite? Well, perlite is this layered structure of ferrite and cementite, right? So if we're below the eutectoid composition, we're gonna have regions of ferrite and regions of perlite, right? Perlite is a composite. If we are above the eutectoid composition, we're gonna have pure cementite and regions of perlite, All right? So okay. So if we think about the formation of perlite, I mean of ferrite, so we're going to be, if we're nucleating ferrite first, this means we have to be uh, hypo-eutectoid. Right, And so there's two ways that this can form. We can form, uh, my tongue always gets tied when I try and say allotriomorphic, right? Which essentially means ferrite that nucleates heterogeneously at the grain boundary, right? So here we have our austenite grain boundaries and we're going to nucleate at the grain boundary heterogeneously. And this is a, what is called grain boundary allot allotromorphs. We also have idiomorphic nucleation, idiomorphic ferrite that can form. This nucleates heterogeneously as well on inclusions present in the steel, in the austenite, right? And idiomorphic ferrite forms a strong orientation relationship with the surrounding austenite, right? So idiomorphic ferrite has these faceted-like interfaces Whereas the allotromorphic ferrite forms this kind of like blobular globular type structure on the grain boundary, right? So what do this, this grain boundary, uh, this orientation relationship look like? Well, there's lots of different orientation relationships for steel. The most important one is this kurjumov sachs right, which is given by this relationship, right? So I have the close packed 111 plane is aligned with the 110 plane in the BCC and these directions, the close packed direction, 
aligns with this 111 direction. So what does that look like in practice? Well, in FCC, our close packed planes are the 111 planes and our close back packed directions are the 110 directions, right? So here we see a close packed FCC direction on the close packed plane. Well, in BCC, we don't have a close packed plane, but we do have a close packed direction. And the close packed direction is the body diagonal, the 111. So for this idiomorphic ferrite, we want to form a, the most coherent interface. And the way to do that is to align the close pack direction in BCC with the close pack direction in FCC. And then we have the most densely packed plane in our BCC structure aligned with the close packed plane in FCC. And this is going to give us the lowest possible interfacial energy, right? And this kurjumov sachs orientation relationship appears over and over and over again in steel, right? So when we see this idiomorphic ferrite, we see they, these nuclei grow with this faceted structure and these edges pre, are arranged so that they preserve this kurjumov sachs orientation relationship, right? So here we see a micrograph. Here's the actual allotromorphic ferrite nucleated heterogeneously on the grain boundary. And here we see idiomorphic ferrite starting to form in the grain, right? And then um, the last thing here before on Friday, we'll talk about perlite. Um, is if we have very low carbon, we can actually get a massive transformation, right? We can go right from ferrite, uh, austenite to ferrite without any change in composition, right? In which case we largely preserve our austenite grain structure, right? And so we'll um, talk a little bit about Vidmanstatin ferrite, which and uh, perlite on uh, on Friday, and that will essentially wrap up sort of our diffusive uh, phase transformations. Um, there will be a reading assignment posted today with a reading quiz for uh, um, next Wednesday. And there'll be another homework assignment posted probably tomorrow, okay? So um, uh, yeah, it's, it's in the lecture and there's some reading on this in the textbook. So um, this sort of extra material will be examinable, right? But it's not definitely not going to be the main focus, right? I just wanted to pull this out and put some of the theory that we talked about into the context of real important actual material systems. Okay, everyone enjoy the holiday and uh, uh, we'll see you on Friday. You got a second to talk about the exam? Uh, sure. So I, I'm just a little confused here. Um, look, 